As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones. And whom is all my delight? The meter's going? Perfect. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply their drink offerings of blood. I would not pour out or take their names on my lips. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. We count it an honor that you would be able to pour in this session your presence. Lord, I know for a fact right now that you are in love with each and every one of us in this room. With that being known, we understand that you will be able and desire to pour out of me the exact words you have for us. God, I honor you today and I appreciate you being with me. With that being said, I come against every demonic spirit, every plot, every scheme, every witch, every warlock, every curse, every spell, anything that may be trying to come after this moment. This moment is sanctified for the Lord's use and there will be no demonic interference and the word that God has will be spoken. So we counsel every plot and every scheme in this moment in the name of Jesus. And with that being said, God, we thank you for that authority that we have in Christ. And we know, Father God, like I always say, if you're not in this room, I'm wasting your time. So God, please speak through me today like never before. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Today we're going to be talking about don't neglect your field. Don't or do not, whatever the proper grammar, <laughs> do not or don't neglect your fields. Last week we talked about verse 1 in the text where David began to say, preserve me your God. So we talked about the strength of, not the strength of joy, but the thief of joy is the devil's attempt to steal us from God's presence. And we talked about seven or so things that keeps us in the presence of God. Last week we talked about preservation, where, where God wants to preserve us. And in his presence we are being preserved physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually we are being preserved. Today we're going to talk about what's evident in verse 3 about participation. The Bible reads again, let me read it one more time. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones. In whom is all my delight? Let's go right to our objective. Our objective this evening is to discover and to learn how to tend the fields God has for us to steward. Our objective this evening is to discover and to learn how to tend the fields God has for us to steward. Let's go to the problem. Many believers are either neglecting their fields or participating in the wrong ones, leading to an unplucked harvest. Many believers are either neglecting their fields or participating in the wrong ones, leading to an unplucked harvest. Let's go to the cause. These believers have allowed depression and or distractions to drift them from having their delight be in God and for his people. Whatever has your delight has your desires. For God to be your delight, you must be full of and in the light. Many believers are either neglecting their fields or participating in the wrong ones, leading to an unplucked harvest. These believers have allowed depression and or distractions to drift them from having their delight, their joy, their awe, being God and for his people. Whatever has your delight has your desires. For God to be your delight, you must be full of and in delight. Many believers have been caught, observed, in neglecting their fields. When we talk about fields, we're talking about the place that we're supposed to be in position. The place where we're supposed to steward. Our field represents our calling, our purpose, the predestined will of God. So many believers have allowed depression or distractions to drift them from actually being in awe of God. In order for me to build, in order for me to thrive, in order for me to, 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 to do what I'm called to do, God has to be my awe. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. 
Many people, and I'm sure you guys have heard me before say that a lot of people twist that scripture in saying that if I do certain disciplines or if I go to church, if I do the bare minimum, then God owes me my desires. No, the text is trying to imply that whatever you delight in will determine your desires. That if I truly delight in God, my desires will mimic, match, correspond, correlate with his original desires. Meaning ever since the fall, in, the fall of the world, ever since Eve and Adam partook in the demonic plan of Satan, at that moment, God's desires wasn't, pre, wasn't set aside for our ultimate enjoyment. His, his objective wasn't about your best life or, or getting consumed with all these trinkets that come with life. He endeavors for every man to be saved. See, many people think that God endeavors to bring surplus in their life. No, God wants to bring salvation. Salvation is more, more in-depth than we perceive because many people look at salvation based upon my benefit and my benefit alone versus being a benefit versus being a blessing versus being saint-centered and not self-centered being more focused about what the gospel endeavors leaving sin behind because we know for a fact there's a better life to live and so many of us are sitting on the edge of our plots sit on the edge of our fields doing nothing many people are depressed some are distracted, but either way, we're all going to be held accountable for what we did in our field. We were created not to be for ourselves. We were meant to participate. We were meant to engage. We was meant to snatch out. We was meant to be firefighters. We were meant to go into the fire, pull people out. We was designed to be more focused on others. That's why my question to you is, who has your delight? Because whoever you delight in or whatever you delight in will determine your desires. And whoever is in the front wheel drive or the front driver's side of your desires will determine your destiny. Where are you headed today? Delight. It is my responsibility to engage in my calling. What are you engaging in today? What do you spend the most time in today? No soldier that has been saved by God was supposed to entangle themselves with civilian affairs. For their ultimate joy or mission is to please the one that enlisted them. That since God has enlisted me, and if I'm a soldier, that means there's a war. You're a soldier because of a threat of war or the, uh, or the actual uh, presence of war. Either way, we got to make sure that we're saying, what civilian affairs am I entangling myself with? Am I entangled with my need for a relationship? Am I entangled with my need of success? What are you entangling yourselves in that's distracting you from the one that enlisted you? Distracting you from the one who has called you? Because the sad thing about a lot of believers, they're sitting on the sidelines of life and they're wondering why the coach ain't called them in the game. Because the coach has realized that your focus is all about who's in the stands. Your focus is all about what's going on, but you're not engaging. My question to you is, are you engaging? Are you engaging in your workplace? Are you engaging with your family's cookouts or whatever? Are you engaging? Are you even sensitive enough to be perceiving, sensitive enough to actually see the purpose that God has for you daily. See, some of us are more consumed with the grand purpose and, and, and the, the, the stage, but we forget about the steps that leads there. Each step matters. So many of us want the platform and we try to jump over the path without saying, God, where I'm at today where, ha where you have planted me, I'm going to participate in your purpose. There's a big difference between being buried and being planted. Buried means death is over. A seed can be confused if it's his first time, can be confused when it's underground. Many of us where we are, we're confused because we think this is where death is. Where you're planted is not where death is. Where you planted is where you need to be planted in order to have life. 
Soil can bury and soil can nurture. It depends on the, 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 the ecosystem of the individual. So when a person is aware that the soil was, is for the seed's benefit, not for the seed's detriment, then you will engage with the soil, knowing that the soil is going to bring forth the nutrients and the anchor you need for the fruit to be stable. But so many of us are trying to jump out of soils where God has planted us, not knowing that God wants you to engage. Are you depressed today? The devil utilized depression as the number one distraction. Because depression is evidence that your delight is not in God. There's no way a person who is truly in love with the living Jesus, that's truly in love with God, that's depressed. Saddened maybe, disappointed possibly, but never depressed. Depression means you put too much in a thing that is incapable of sustaining you. Depression is the fruit of believing the lie that this thing can support me a certain way versus uh, -uh I'm not putting all my eggs the only basket you should put your, all your eggs in is God's basket but what do we do we put one egg in there just for just in case <laughs> a little 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 nest <laughs> just in case and we put other 96 other eggs in this basket and we wondering why things are broken everywhere I promise you God's hands are huge but they're delicate it don't matter what you place in his hands. I don't care what it is. It will not break. But the thing about it is many of us are engaging in the wrong things, investing in the wrong things, putting too much stock in the wrong things. And the devil says, let me lure you away from your dependence in God, get you to make an investment over here. So that when you make these investments in this thing, the ticking bomb, I call them spiritual super su I call them spiritual suicide bombers. They get close to you with a timer. And over time, that thing that was in your life will blow up in your life cause and destruction that's why be very careful who and what you allow in your life and be very careful what you invest in because whatever the devil sends has a clock on it and it's ticking that guy you thought loved the Lord is just ticking that girl you thought loved Jesus with all her heart she's ticking that person that you befriended because y'all have some common interest is ticking be very careful because witches know how to smile and get comfortable and get close be very careful who you allow whether they are a witch or a witch unknowingly because even deceitfulness is the fruit of witchcraft and that's why you got to be very careful what you allow in your life. Many of us are engaging in the wrong things and neglecting the right things. Many believers are either neglecting their fields or participating in the wrong ones. There are certain people who are very productive, very active, but active in the wrong areas. God don't care if you run many miles, produce many fruit, in the wrong place. God don't care. The Bible talks about in Corinthians, be very careful how you build on the foundation, which is Jesus. The Bible talks about that some people will build with hay and straw and some will build with gold and precious stones. But the Bible says all of their works will be tried by fire, meaning when all believers go to get judged by God, that every work they ever did will be tested by fire. The Bible says those who build with hay and straw, their whole works will be burnt. Their soul will be saved, but their works will be burnt. Be very careful how you build because many people are in the wrong place and they're wondering why they're not reading the supernatural benefits of engaging in the right place that's why I challenge and I and I warn everyone in this room to make sure before you do anything significant make sure you consult God how many things do we do without even acknowledging God the Bible says trust in the Lord with all your heart lean not <laughs> onto your own understandings but in all it didn't say some all of your ways Acknowledge him. Ways are significant. We're not talking about you're on the way to the bathroom, on the way to the kitchen. We're not talking about on those kind of ways. We're talking about major highways of your life. That I have to make sure, okay, God, before I get in this vehicle, 
to pursue this, to make this turn. I'm going to acknowledge you. Is this the one? Is this the right place? Is this the right season? Should I plant or should I put on the soil? God, what should I do? And I'm going to sit here until I have clarity. How many of us have that kind of patience to say, God, I will sit until I am sure. I will sit until I'm sure. But many of us run off of fantasy. We run off of goosebumps. We jump at the moment we hear someone even say anything that goes with what we want to be confirmed versus what God wants to confirm. That's why it's our responsibility to say, God, I'm not going to move until you say so. When a runner is on a line, Jacob, you understand this. If they jump before the gun, they're penalized. Football players, if you're on the line and you jump before the ball is moved, there's a flag. How many of us got flags and this close to being disqualified because we jump before he tells us? When you jump, you penalize. You got to have a sense of awareness and a certain level of poise to say, I'm not moving until he says move. You got to be in a certain type of life where, where sometimes you don't move until the brook is dried. You don't move. See, most people be like, well, I ain't going to no widow woman's house. God, what you talking about? She don't got no food for her own family. God says, wherever I go, I promise you, you'll be blessed there. But so many of us, impulsiveness, I want it. Listen, if you want God more than you want anything else, you will barely move in life. You will barely budge. Because you be like, no, I'm good here. <laughs> if you ain't getting up, God ain't getting up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> we having a good conversation with somebody, and you know, you be hoping, hope this ain't the last sentence. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You be, trying to, you be trying to add another sentence, another intriguing statement, another something to get them talking more. Listen, if God ain't moving, I ain't moving. But you gotta be so close and in tune with God that you know when he moves. See, many of us, we move without understanding. Depression, distraction, distractions are anything that comes before something more important. Some of our greatest distractions are good things placed in the wrong order. Ain't nothing wrong with certain things. They're just wrong when they're out of order. If God comes number two or it comes second after anything, that's the wrong order. Your first five to ten breaths should have the words, Father, I thank you. Before your eyes look at a screen and look at notifications, your eyes should look up to heaven and say, God, I thank you. Before you take a step to the kitchen or to the bathroom or to the TV, you look at your feet and say, God, I'm thankful that I can walk. If you don't have any legs, before you go to that wheelchair, before you ask for assistance, take another deep breath and say, God, I'm thankful that I'm alive. Your first five to 10 to 15 breaths should be dedicated to God. If anything precedes that, then you got to check your heart because whatever your flesh reaches out for first, that is what it wants most. You got to say, you know what, God, I'm going to train my flesh. You know what I tell people? I tell people, put your phone in another room. Put your Bible by your bed. First off, if the alarm goes off, you got to get up and cut it off. Also heard Denzel Washington say, they say, he said, what he say? He said, put your shoes so far up under the bed that when you get out the bed, you have to get on your knees. You got to set, I wish I could steal that, but I gave you credit, Denzel, if you're watching. <laughs> what we have to do is to ensure that we train this flesh to honor God. The spirit is willing, the Bible says, but the flesh is weak. You got to make sure your flesh is as strong, but being led by your spirit. Meaning you train his flesh. If you got to put your shoes so far up under bed, soon as your knees touch the ground, you are training your flesh what to do first. If you're prone like I used to be to reach for my phone, put it in another room or put it in the bathroom if you're in a hotel. Put it somewhere far from you so that when you wake up, 
If you can pass over your Bible to go grab for your phone, check your heart. I was guilty. I wanted to check my stats. I wanted to see how many people retweeted something. But I had to recondition my mind and my soul to make sure that God gets the first fruits. We talk so much about the tenth of tithes, but does God get a tenth of your life? Does he get a tenth of your time? Does he, can he get two and a half hours of your time? Can he, can, can he, I'm not sitting there saying pray for two and a half hours, but can you, can your spirit just be available just in case? Because some of us have missed great opportunities to engage because of what our flesh is enslaved to. The flesh is willing. Oh, the spirit is willing. But that flesh is weak. Delight, let's talk about definition. Delight is a high degree of gratification or pleasure. Delight, David was saying, he says, look, I have no good apart from you for as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is my delight. Delight is a high degree of gratification or pleasure. Something or someone that gives great pleasure. Many of us are trapped in the cycles of temporary pleasures instead of being content in eternal pleasures. Invest in eternal pleasures, not internal pressures. Many of us are trapped in the cycles of temporary pleasures. Instead of being content in eternal pleasures, invest in internal pleasures, not internal pressures. Trapped in cycles. The flesh wants so madly wants to be fulfilled. But the, what the flesh doesn't know <clears throat> is that from the garden, our DNA, body, soul, and spirit has been disjoined, disconnected. Now, what was what's in the garden of Eden, our being was one. That's why God said, let's make man in our image. Since God is three in one, you heard me say this, but for those who are new, he created us three in one. The difference between God and us is that God has no variance in him. There's no separation in him that, that God, the father that created, the son that saved and the Holy Spirit that regenerates, they're one in eternity, expressed three ways in time. That trinity, that unison, is what God endeavors for his man and his woman to experience. That experience where our whole being is being led by his spirit. Meaning that I, if I kill my flesh daily, which dilutes my desires for the wrong things, will begin to be in unison. That's why you feel God's presence best when all of you is worshiping. Some of us, our flesh is just worshiping. We hear a song, our ears, our earring, our hearing, our hands, our, our emotions, but our spirit is thinking of something else. Our spirit is dark or our mind is wondering. But when the mind, body, spirit, and soul come together, then you begin to feel God's presence best. But the tragedy happened when we forsook the presence of God. When we get into a place where we say, God, I want your presence. In his presence, our whole being will desire to participate in his purpose. With that being said, we begin to fail in engaging because we're not willing to be unified internally. So what happens is our flesh, which is separated from the spirits leading at times, will begin to desire and want things that's not good for you. It's flesh, your flesh is now desiring fulfillment that it cannot have on its own. So it's saying, give me the sex and hopefully the sex will fulfill me. Give me this, this money and hopefully I'll be fulfilled. But there's a loophole in that clause that if my spirit is not leading, 
the Holy Spirit leading me, then whatever my flesh touches will be to my detriment. True fulfillment won't happen until the flesh is dead, the mind is renewed, the soul is in love, and the spirit is aflamed. When that's not happening, you won't be able to be satisfied. So what happens is we put our spirits in anorexic state. We put our flesh in obesity. And so what happens when we begin to feed the flesh all the time, we become unbalanced. So what happens is we're luring ourselves into temptations and into desires and we're awakening appetites that the flesh is that, that makes the flesh too hard to let go my question to you is what appetites are you feeding because that appetite you know how it is when you give a baby his first glass of kool-aid orange juice apple juice or whatever flavoring beverage you that so beautiful child so desires it no longer wants water when you're when the devil tempts you into tasting or awakening something before your maturity, your flesh wants it now. That's why the Bible says don't awaken love before it's time. It didn't say in that text that love is bad. It just says it has a proper time of usage. Many people are using mature things in their selfish, sinful, unregenerated elementary state and they're wondering why they're so depraved distant can't feel God even if he was close no sense of awareness boasting of a relationship that you don't have God said man they honor me Josh they the Bible read reads they honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from how many people how many church can you walk into and the worship is loud the praise is magnificent the light show is in correspondence with any hot band of the late 80s the, the beautifulness of the unison of the choirs and all this stuff and God ain't even there how can you have a million dollar worship budget and God ain't there? I'd rather have five dollars voices and then, listen, it don't matter how well God don't care about how talented you are. He cares about how dependent you are in him. God will take an old 90 year old woman on the cliffs of West Virginia and her worship. He'll entertain that over any band that ain't loving God. And chances are those that can um, um, package their worship in such a beautiful way, probably God ain't there. Have you heard some of these worship teams? first album you felt the present but when you get an album five or six it's so commercialized that Christ ain't in it because people are chasing the money partnering with people that don't even love God why are these musicians partnering with the world the world should be changing themselves to be on your tracks they should not listen listen why would you even allow See, there's a difference between ministry and maintenance I don't need a Christian plumber I need a good plumber. I don't need a Christian electrician. I need a good electrician. But when it comes to doing ministry, you gotta be saved with fruit, with keeping with repentance. Ministry and maintenance are two totally different things. I don't need a super saved person to take care of the house, but I need a super saved person to make sure the house of God's people are not tainted with philosophies and ideologies of inclusion. When we get to a place, <laughs> where we delight in God more than anything, we will be on the right path. Cycles of temporary pleasures. Instead of being content in eternal pleasures, eternal pleasures means, God, I'm, in, I'm so into your presence, man. You, you would be disgusted at the suggestions of sin. Uh-uh, man, no, 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 you, you trying to get me away from who? God? Oh, I ain't sinning, bro. I may make a mistake, but I'm not going to willfully jump in. I understand if you're growing. I'm, listen, I'm, babies touch things they ain't supposed to. I understand there's a difference between being a baby Christian and a Christian that boasts in being mature but still acting like a babe, right? I'm not, now let me make it sure it's clear. I'm not sitting there saying <clears throat> that you're gonna be sinning, that you're gonna uh, be sinless, but the more you engage with God, you should be sinning less. It's a big difference. 
If you're a babe and you mess up, that's why I'm realistic with certain people. There are certain people who've been drastically saved by God and their taste is over. But there are certain people that got some complicated stories and situations that takes delicate care and, 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 and God's ever so hand to pull them out of. It's hard for a person. I didn't be talking about people who... who uh, I bet the church be talking bad about strippers, be talking bad about drug dealers, but don't want to give them jobs. Don't want to pay into the young girl's bills. You don't got no job for her. She's stripping because you got to take care of her babies. So instead of talking about her sins, can we provide and be a solution? That's why God wants us to participate. God's people are my delight. Since I delight in you, God, God's people are my delight. So whatever it is, listen, I know you're probably going to be on that pole for the two months, but secretly we're going to be saving money to get you out of there. If it's a need, if the reason why they are in sin is because of need, the church is supposed to meet that need so they can come out of that sin. But what do we do? We spend money on recreation instead of reaching people. Imagine if we, listen, imagine we had more shelters. Imagine if all the churches in one city took their 10th of the other people's 10th, quote unquote, and put that in a, a, a city bucket. And all, you know how much money would be in a city? There would be 50 shelters, 50 women's shelters, 50 men's shelters. There would not be no, the Bible says there was no need among them. But how many needs are amongst us? Too many. Next point, our delight should be in God and in those that are being drawn by his goodness and those that are devoted to his glory. Our delight should be in God and in those that are being drawn by his goodness, meaning people that ain't quite having evidence of being saved. <laughs> they ain't showing no fruit, but you don't know what type of goodness God is using to draw them. And we also got to make sure that we are for those who are devoted to his glory. Those who are being drawn by his goodness are people who we don't even know, but we see God pursuing them. God is keeping them. We see his safety net around them. We see his hand, but they're still out there sinning. They may not have a tangible evidence of salvation, but God is pursuing them. Also, our delight should be though for those who are seasoned and devoted to his glory. Listen, the next point says, it is hard being a player in the land. It says, I have no good apart from you as for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones. I know it's hard for LeBron being a player in Cleveland, but it's even as harder as it is for LeBron this upcoming year will be hard for us in this land. <laughs> the one LeBron fan right here. You're not really, okay, it is hard being a player in the land. Our joy deepens when we get to participate with the plans or plays of God. Our joy deepens when we get to participate. That's an honor that he gives us the opportunity to actually participate within the plans or plays of God. It's sad that many believers choose to remain on the sidelines of life, watching, worrying, whispering, and whining, instead of helping others win. It's sad that many believers, <clears throat> if they are, choose to remain on the sidelines of life, watching, worrying, whispering, and whining, instead of helping others win. The game is fixed. We just have to go with the flow. The game is fixed. We just have to go with the flow. All of this is fixed. <laughs> Satan already got the L. <laughs> he already lost. He's just trying to, <laughs> he, he lost in eternity, but he think he has a chance in time. But he doesn't know who is governing or sovereign over time. Your situation is so fixed, <laughs> all you got to do is go with the flow. When you're flowing into warfare and you're flowing into a situation and you're flowing, you got to understand that if God leads you there, he'll get you through there. That wherever God is and if he's truly your delight and you love him, you know that everything that you're going through is going to be turned around for your good, for those that are called, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. 
Many people just say everything, all things going to work around, what's the scripture? All things going to work around for my good, but they don't finish the sentence. All things works for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If you ain't in love and you ain't even want to accord to his purpose, it ain't working for your good, baby boy. It ain't working for your good. His goodness may be drawing you into that place where things work around for your good, but that's why we got to make sure we take an inventory of ourselves and say, am I truly saved? Have I been converted? Do I have fruit bearing with repentance? Because God, if I want everything to turn around for my good, I only know it's going to birth out of my love for you and me working according to your purpose. Why would God make everything work for your good if you're in the wrong place? Why would God make everything work in your good if you're pridefully, arrogantly, relentlessly staying in this place? Homosexuality doesn't send you to hell. Being a transgender doesn't send you to hell. Sleeping around doesn't send you to hell. A prideful heart does. Those acts that we think are immoral fail into comparison or ankle, anchor themselves in a prideful heart. When a person wants to stay this way, a liar, a cheater, a manipulator want to stay that way, they're going to hell. Because the Bible talks about that the number one sin is what? What does it say? It's grieving? No, no. It's a, a blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Now, what does that mean? Blaspheming the Holy Ghost is not saying out of your mouth, I blaspheme the Holy Ghost. It's living a life that blasphemes them. Living a life that says, I don't want your work. Imagine you trying to give somebody a million dollar check. They look at your check and be like, I don't want it. Bro, you, you live up under a bridge. You don't want to get blessed? No, 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 I like my bridge. This ain't even your bridge. That's how a lot of people treat God. When God gives them salvation, they say, I'm, I'm comfortable under this bridge. Will those sins lead you away from God? Surely, but there's no sin strong enough that the blood can't cleanse. It don't matter what sin you're in or what sin you're facing. That blood can cleanse. But if you refuse the blood being transferred on you, that's what sends people there. That's why many people think that the immoral, quote unquote, will feel hell. No, it will be the people who know the name. There's going to be a lot of Christians by title alone. That's going to probably be some of the, the main people in hell. Because pride and prestige keeps you from participating in touching the least of these. Building cathedrals nowhere close to the hood. Building things and magnificent things and, 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 and can't even get to the people. He says, man, what you do to the least of these, you've done unto me. Now, what am I saying? If you practice those sins that I've named before, that's the fruit of a prideful heart. But if God pursues you, you won't live that way long. I'll make sure I clean that up. But when you understand that the foundation of all sins is arrogance, then you will change your ways. Our joy deepens when we get to participate within the plans or plays of God. It's sad that many believers choose to remain on the sidelines of life, watching, worrying, whispering, and whining instead of helping others win. Our responsibility is to make sure that we help ensure that we win and that others win. Like I said before, the game is fixed. We just have to go with the flow. Each one of us have a part to play and you are the answer to someone's problem. Each one of us have a part to play and you are the answer to someone's problem. The sad thing is there are more problems than there are answers. Some of us are so full of problems that we cannot even be close to being someone's answer. When are we gonna to get to a place where we say, you know what God, 
whose question am I supposed to answer? I went to West Virginia and, and um, it was an honor being on that campus, West Liberty University, and the front row was full of football players. I went to their practices, and of course, football players would be football players, but when they came to that event, what they told me afterwards was not shocking, but humbling. One of the gentlemen came up to me, which I'm gonna send you the book if you're watching. He came to me, he was like, I ain't been to church since I was a baby, but you got me thinking. I don't want nothing to do with God, but when I heard you speak, you got me thinking. I thought about that going to the hotel room because I was like, man, what if I didn't come here? What if I didn't speak? What if I wasn't led by your spirit and wouldn't talk whatever I want to talk about? It wouldn't have got him thinking. But Josh, did you get him saved? Oh no, but I got him thinking. <laughs> if you get him thinking, you're not too far from the kingdom, son. And what happens, we want to, we want to get the sale right there, but don't have no good customer service. <laughs> We want the sale, but we don't want the connection. When people know you're trying to sell them something, they don't want nothing to do with what you're offering. But if you're just being a vessel, have great customer service, call back, <laughs> make sure the product gets there on time, <laughs> do what you gotta do. The fact that they're thinking, who have you sparked thoughts in? What thought pattern have you initiated? What trail of thoughts have been laid because of your sacrifice of living a certain way? I'm not sitting there saying that, that, oh, look at what Josh did. No, 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 it's like, it got me thinking though. I said, God, I wanna make people around me get the thoughts going. But if I'm compromising, they ain't gonna be thinking about nothing different. They go, listen, when you live a holy life and you live a pure life, holy life doesn't mean, oh man, I'm perfect. No, it just means, hey, I'm honest. I don't tell people, I tell them on the stage all the time, I ain't perfect. I'm just as guilty as you are. I just got grace. <laughs> Please be a part of this grace. Please, the, while the doors are open, come in, because we're all guilty. I just got the blood on my doorpost, so when he sees me, he don't see me. He sees Jesus, but when he sees you, he sees you. That means you're guilty. We got to be, in order to change the world, you got to be different from it. You can't change and compromise. Solutions and souls. Our job is to be a solution to someone's deprived soul. Solutions don't have to be on the pulpit preaching. It can be at your job. That doesn't mean you go out there and be like, do you know Jesus? I work at a, a, at a public school. I can't say the name publicly. But if I live that name, it's funny, man. I got these kids coming to me telling me, my mom watches your video. My dad watches your videos. <laughs> I found you on YouTube. I didn't tell you I was on YouTube. But what if I walked in there? Yeah, man, I got a YouTube channel about Jesus. <laughs> I, got a, I got books about Jesus. No, 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 no. When people discover your commitment to your faith without you divulging your commitment to your faith, they have a better chance of being changed. Because they're gonna be like, why you didn't tell me you wrote a book? I didn't know you was on YouTube. Hear me when I say this, keep your relationship with God private and let him reveal it public. What I mean by that, if you conceal so much of him, a lot of him will come out of you. <laughs> If you just say, Jesus, I'll, listen, what you do behind closed doors will manifest yourself in the public. If you do nothing but lustful things at home, your eyes are going to show at the world what you do at home. But when you say, you know what, God, we're going to keep our relationship private. If you want to hold my hand in public, that's cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's cool. But we're going to keep you private. And I want my life to do the talking. 
Lips don't matter. Lip service don't matter. A life of service matters. People know who you live for because you can't hide fruit. Let's transition. I got eight points real quick for the next 15 minutes. The process of tending your field, AKA the process of delivering your purpose to those being drawn and those that are already devoted. The process of tending your field. The whole purpose of this message is for us to understand what it means to engage in the field. The Bible says the harvest is right, but the laborers are few. A young man was taking the pictures and when you talk at college campuses, man, they ain't no hallelujah corners <coughs> unless you go to ORU or Southern, uh, where these Christian college, you might get some amens. But when you're in a secular environment, some are Christian athletes and some just, just came there for the free t-shirts and food. But when you look into their eyes, if you're so consumed with the praise and the worship and the amens, you will miss out on the listening ear. And I, was, I, I learned this a long time ago, but when I looked them in their eyes, you could tell they were hungry. As a farmer, I knew the soil was rich. Many of us are not even aware enough to see that the soil around you is actually ready and rich. All you got to do is plant the seed. Planting the seed doesn't mean, oh, do you know a man? The seed means you plant seeds unaware. You plant seeds even when you're quiet because people listen best with their eyes. It don't matter what you, like I tell the story all the time, my mom told me as a kid, do not drink out the orange juice carton. But on my way to the bathroom, I peeped in the kitchen, I saw you drink out the orange, orange juice carton, so I thought it was okay to drink out the orange juice carton. We do what we see. We don't listen to what people say. If your lifestyle outweighs your lips, what you say out your lips won't matter unless your lifestyle is better than what anybody else's lips can say. What I mean by that is, your life should have more volume than your words. And I promise you, when you speak, people will listen. The process of tending your field means being aware that the souls around you or the souls around you, soil souls around you are rich and ready. Number one, in order to get to that place, you have to recognize your depravity. Number one, you got to recognize that you are a wretch undone, that you're wretched, ratchet, messed up, toe up. You and your own can't do nothing for nobody without God. I have to recognize my depravity. I have to recognize that I got a problem. And Jesus even said, flesh and blood revealed this not to you. In order for your depravity to be recognized, you can't discover it. God must reveal it. His goodness will make you so humble that you'll be like, God, you love me? What? <laughs> like, real talk, you... you when God, listen, God can do the smallest thing in my life, I am blown away. You're that invested in me? That goodness, that's why they're changing in CMS. They're changing the way they punish kids. <laughs> they're getting biblical with theirs. They was telling us that they want restorative practices, meaning instead of suspending, 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 give grace. It wasn't the suspension that saved us. It was the grace that saved us. That doesn't mean you just keep giving and they keep doing you wrong, but for the kids that really want to change, instead of just hitting on them quick, give them grace, they will listen and understand better. But what happens to most people is they don't even know they're deprived. Empty, diluted, dark, wicked. And so many of those people are in our churches. Number two, make, after you recognize your depravity, you must make the decision to be completely dependent on God. You gotta make a decision. A decision is an incision. Decision means to cut. That if I decide to be with this woman, I gotta cut all other women off. If you make a decision to follow God this way, you gotta cut everything off. If you're indecisive, 
you haven't made a decision. Or if you're indecisive, you, has, you have made your decision. You made a decision not to choose. But when you make a decision, really make a decision, you're saying, God, I'm cutting this sin off today. And when you truly want to be dependent on God, you will do whatever it takes to be separated from sin. You will do whatever. If you want that porn addiction out of your life, you will make, you will do what it takes. If you want this sin out of your life, this sex out of your life, this drug, this alcohol, you will do whatever. Even if you mess up along the way, you're going to do, you're going to be relentless because you made a decision to follow Jesus. He says, but before you follow me, you must deny yourself. Oh, self is one of the hardest things to deny because we have been in ourselves for so many years. We got to get to a place where we say, man, this joker is the number one person responsible for all of my failure. So I can't trust in him no more. After I recognize my depravity, I got to make the decision to be completely, to completely, not partially, completely depend on God. Depend on God means, God, I trust you. I'm going to choose a job you want. I'm going to go where you want. I'm going to marry who you want. I'm depending on you and I'm not moving until you deliver. Dependence means waiting on his deliveries. It don't mean going and following UPS. It don't mean going crazy. No, I, uh, I'm going to wait here until you deliver. Number three. After I have recognized my depravity, made a decision to be completely dependent on God, build, I will build my delight in God through devotion. Your delight coming to God is going to be great. When people get say they love God at all time high, but what happens when you don't put wood in fire, that fire goes out. Devotion keeps the fire burning. Devotion ensures that, 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 that delight is built because when you're devoted to God and you're building in the devotion because your motion should be towards your devotion always. It doesn't mean a book. It means, God, I'm in motion to be in devotion all the time. God, if you need, before you walk into any place, God, I am devoted to you and I'm in motion to do whatever you want me to do in every area. After that, dream big dreams. Why do you dream big dreams? Because once you recognize your depravity, your old dream is gone. Your old life is gone because you made a decision to be completely dependent on God. And from that, your delight is being built. And number four, you must dream big dreams because big dreams without your ability to accomplish them will always keep you dependent on God. So when you say, God, show me your dream for me. And God will show you a big dream so a big God can be incorporated in them. After that, you must discover your specific role, audience, and assignment. Discover. When God shows you that big dream, God, what's my role? Who is my audience? And what's my... Listen, specific. God is not... God, we think God is vague. God is specific. Ask Noah, God was specific. Ask Solomon, God was specific. The temple and the ark needed those specific details to ensure it's lasting. And so many of us are not willing to be patient enough to hear the specifics. God, what is my specific role, my specific call, my specific uh, 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 anointing? What's my specific gifting, spiritual gifting? God, what are my specifics? Because God says it's planted in you. God doesn't put things in you. He put it in you before when you was formed. Before he zipped you up in your womb, he stuffed everything in you. All he's doing is making you aware of it inside of you and pulling it out of you. Your role is in you. Your audience is in you. And your assignment is in you. You just got to discover it internally in your devotion. Next, you must build dedication through discipline. All this is pointless without discipline at the core of disciple is discipline a disciple is a disciplined one i got to build my dedication through discipline i got to treat this like i'm running a marathon soon i got to i got to i got to treat this thing like 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 man like like 
my my you know your kids depend on it you gotta you gotta be disciplined because you know because it, d discipline is in the details because the details will determine growth if you fine-tune the details you will have significant growth next be relentless in defending your growth and the growth of others you must defend it and all this is is you you got to defend your growth you got to defend your devotion you got to defend your delight you got to defend it no 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 any person that comes in your life that even hints towards hindering you cut them off oh the devil will send them spiritual suicide bombers into your life because he knows all I got to do is make you fall in love with him, make you fall in love with her. All I got to do is get you interested in love with it. Then I will use that thing you love and magnify it in your life to the point to where you love that more than God. Then I got you. You got to defend your growth because what happens when you work out for three or four weeks and take one week off it make your body feels like it's starting all the way over. You might as well stick with it. Number eight, deliver your purpose continuously without compromise. When I tend my field and my delight is in God and his people, I would know that I'm depraved or I've been set free from that. And when you're aware of that, you'll make sure, fellas, when you're around women, you won't become a downfall. Women, you're around men, you won't become a downfall. When you're around other believers, you won't become a downfall because you know just how untrustworthy this flesh is. You will continue to do all these different things to ensure that when you deliver your purpose, it's not tainted. When you reach out to people, you truly do. Because if you're delightful in God and you're devoted to God and you discipline and you do all these different things, you love his people. You're sympathetic to the one that's being drawn to him. You're, you're in love with the person who's devoted to his glory because you love his glory. Most people are want to rally behind the people who are devoted to God's glory, but won't lend a lending hand to whose God's goodness is drawing to repentance. You got to treat both audiences correctly. My final thoughts, your what happened will determine who you are to help. Your past will reveal the people group you are to serve. And number two, we need to be more saint-centered than self-centered. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. I pray, Father God, this message was a blessing, helping us refocus and getting us in the game, engaging, tending our harvest, going out there and delivering people, helping people to win. I pray, Father God, as we continue on in this life that we'll understand your love. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name we do pray, amen. For those who's watching on YouTube, I want to say thank you guys so much for watching online. For those listening on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, we greatly appreciate you guys' support. Feel free to go to the description boxes below. There's some areas for you to give, get involved, get me out to your city. And I'd love to see you. Feel free to talk about this in the description box or in the comment section. I would love to see what you're thinking. I love you guys. Till next time, stay committed.